This special meeting of the Waco Independent School Board is hereby called to order. All items discussed or voted upon this evening have been posted as required by state law. I extend a warm welcome to those present and to our television viewers. The board's purpose is to set goals, listen to reports of the superintendent, approve budgets, contracts and personnel appointments, and make policy for the district. We are not here to make management decisions or solve problems of individuals. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent and her staff. I ask that you turn your cell phones to silent alert if you have not already done so, and we appreciate the time you have taken to join us and your interest in Waco ISD. Please pause with me as we take a moment for prayer, contemplation, reflection, or meditation. Thank you. Mr. DeBeer, special recognitions. Thank you, Madam President. Tonight, we're pleased to have two students from the Greater Waco Advanced Manufacturing Academy to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please welcome Vanessa Aviles and David Omar Crane. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, students. Dr. Rowe, members of the board, would you please join me in front of the dais for tonight's special recognitions? We'll begin the special recognition portion of our meeting this evening as we do each month with an introduction of our pledge leaders who both attend the Greater Waco Advanced Manufacturing Academy. Vanessa Aviles is a senior at Waco High and says that history and English are her favorite subjects. She enjoys welding and loves to sing, draw, and write. As an adult, Vanessa wants to put what she's learned at Guama to good use and become a professional welder. Dr. McCall says she works extremely hard to excel in all of her classes at Guama. Vanessa's sister, Natalie Aviles, has accompanied her here tonight. Would you stand so that we can recognize you as well and celebrate your family and your contributions to our district? David Omar Crane is also a senior studying at Guama, but his home campus is University High School, and his favorite course is robotics. David enjoys working with the Tax Preparation Group, Robotics, Skills USA, the First Lego League, and serves as the First Lego League's president. After high school, David wants to pursue a career working with a bomb squad, uh, as a cop in another capacity, as a lawyer, or as an engineer. So he has a broad horizon ahead of him. <laughs> Dr. McCall says that David's a great leader for Guama students. And David's mother, Michelle Gaines, has joined him here this evening. Michelle, would you please stand so that we can thank you for sharing your son with us? Peter Piper Pizza is one of the district's outstanding partners, and each year the pizza chain holds an annual contest for students to create and submit entries for its school year calendar. For this year's calendar, out of 18 entries that were selected to be part of the art for the calendar, three budding young Waco ISD artists were recognized by having their artwork included, and all three just happened to attend Bells Hill Elementary School. As the students are introduced this evening, take a look at the screens around the room and you'll be able to see their artwork. 
First up, please welcome Destiny Ariana Salinas, a current third grader at Bells Hill Elementary School. Her artwork has helped families mark the days as they head back to school since it graces August in the calendar. Galilea Berrigan, who's currently in first grade at Bells Hill Elementary. <laughs> Galilea's touching artwork was selected to highlight February in the chain's calendar. And finally, please welcome Kayla Cordero, a current fifth grader at Bells Hill, whose artwork was selected for May 2020. <laughs> These are incredibly talented students, but we also have a very talented educator who has helped them to discover their passion and their artistic side. Please welcome Ms. Marilissa Young, an art teacher at Bells Hill Elementary. And I'm excited to note for Dr. Rowe that Ms. Young and the students have an autographed copy of the calendar that they are presenting to her. Congratulations again to our talented young artists. We're proud to have you representing Waco ISD. These next two students are no stranger to special recognitions at board meetings. In fact, you recognized them this past spring when they qualified for the International Thespian Festival. That was a first for University High School. This evening, we get to welcome them back to celebrate their success at the festival competition, which was held in Lincoln, Nebraska this summer from June 24th through the 29th. To qualify for this competition, the students had to first earn a superior rating at their local or regional chapter or conference. These two students each qualified in the technical theater individual events category for their creative work and technical abilities that supported recent school theatrical productions. First, please welcome back Cassidy Coppice, a senior at University High School whose costume construction for Christine's dress from the Phantom of the Opera, you can see it on the screens in front of you, uh, this was awarded at the national competition a superior rating and was just a couple points away from a perfect score. Next for what unfortunately will be her last time at Special Recognitions because she's a graduate, Leslie Cazares, who graduated from University High School this year and is attending MCC. Leslie's design for Bob, A Life in Five Acts, which you can also see on the screen, received a perfect score from the judges at the International Thespian Festival. Of 232 entries in this national competition, just 13 received a perfect score. We're incredibly proud of Leslie's work. And we're also incredibly proud of the educators who lead the theater program at University High School. First, head director Glenn Prince, or Glenn Price, sorry. and technical director, Katie Davis. Congratulations again to Cassidy and Leslie and as well to our theater instructors. We're really proud that you've represented Waco ISD with such success on the national stage. While many students were spending their summer break relaxing, these next three students from University High School were instead practicing, playing, and competing in the 2019 Senior League Softball World Series. Not only did they earn the right to compete in the World Series, which was held in Delaware at the end of July and beginning of August, but they were part of the Central Texas team that fought their way to the top and walked away as World Series champions. 
made up of athletes from all around the area. The District 9 All-Stars first earned the Southwest Regional title in Louisiana in July, then quickly turned around to head to Delaware. During the World Series, the team won against Latin America. They won against the Asia Pacific team twice. They beat the Eastern Region in Canada. For the championship game, they faced off against Delaware, who had beaten them previously in the second game of the series. And after two fairly dramatic weather delays, they stepped up and in a tight game, scored a run at the end of the final inning to bring home a uh, the World Series championship. So please welcome. Representing Waco ISD and University High School, our 2019 Senior League Softball World Series champions, Veronica De Los Rios, a current senior at university. <laughs> Aubrey Garcia, a junior at university. <laughs> and Daniela Ramirez, a current sophomore. And I have to note that as a high school sophomore, this is actually Daniela's second World Series championship. She was part of the Lake Air Little League team that won the World Series title back in 2017. And if you're a family member who's here to support our incredible student athletes tonight, would you please stand so that we can recognize you as well? We're so proud of these girls and equally excited to see what University High School softball has to show this year. You know, Waco ISD is grateful for the work, the energy, and the care that each of our teachers put into their students and their classrooms each and every day. That's one reason why each fall we recognize and honor 25 outstanding teachers, one from each of our campuses, for going above and beyond and doing incredible things for our students. From that field of 25, the district then selects two districts teachers of the year, an elementary teacher and a secondary teacher who move on to a regional competition. And each year from those teachers from the 76 school districts that make up region 12, it's a 12 county region, it really is vast, there are a regional elementary teacher of the year and a regional secondary teacher of the year. And we are incredibly proud and excited that one of our very own was selected this year as the Region 12 Elementary Teacher of the Year. Please welcome Mr. Greg Ubre, who teaches third grade at Dean Highland Elementary. Mr. Ubre has taught for 11 years, and I love how his principal, Tia Allen, describes him. She said he is the picture of high expectations. We are excited for you, Mr. Ubre, but more than that, we're thankful that you continue to choose Waco ISD as the place where you want to serve students and families. Congratulations. We're lucky to have you in our district. In more ways than one tonight, we're focusing on the work of our visual arts teachers and the success that they and their students have demonstrated. The Texas Art Education Association works to recognize districts with outstanding leadership in promoting the arts in their community. One way in which they do this is with this year's inaugural list of districts of distinction. Out of the more than 1,000 districts statewide that were eligible to apply for the designation, only 20 actually completed the expansive multi-point rubric to be selected as a district of distinction. And of course, since we're talking about it tonight, you know that Waco ISD was one of those 20 districts. To represent the entire visual arts staff this evening, please welcome Waco ISD's Director of Fine Arts, Mr. Larry Carpenter. <laughs> uh, 
Of course, he's just representing a broad team, and we know this honor wouldn't be possible without the hard work of all of our visual arts teachers across the district, and many of them have joined us tonight to be with us as well. Would our visual arts teachers please stand so that we can celebrate you too? I want to thank all of you for bringing your passion and your talents to the students of Waco ISD and for helping them discover in themselves their own passion and talents. We have one more very special recognition this evening, but before we turn to it, I'd invite you to return to your seats at the days. In March, after more than 50 years of an educator and well into a much-deserved retirement, Dr. Hazel Rowe answered the call from our district and stepped forward to serve as Waco ISD's interim superintendent. We are incredibly grateful that you said yes to that call. I don't know if it was the first call or the fifth call, but when we got to the yes, <laughs> we're glad we got there. Uh, I'm sure that I speak for all of us in the district who have had truly the pleasure of working with Dr. Rowe over these past few months. Uh, she brings a warmth and a grace and a humor to the district that has been wonderful. She has a laugh that is both incredibly distinctive and that you can't help but smile when you hear it. <laughs> and so we just wanted to pause this evening to say thank you Thank you in particular for stepping forward to serve as Waco ISD's interim superintendent, but thank you beyond that for a lifetime of service to students, nearly all of it here in Waco ISD, here in our region, making a difference in the lives of students. So I think some of the board members may wish to say something, but we also wanted to present you with some, uh, I would say, beautiful flowers as a thank you for the beautiful thing that you have done for our families. Thank you. Madam President. Thank you, Mr. DeBeer. I just want to, uh, on behalf of the board, um, express our appreciation to you for your, um, for, of course, taking our call, um, but then really being a calming, um, reassuring presence to us in a difficult time. And we could not have asked for anybody better to do that but you. And we're so grateful. Uh, Dr. Rowe, sorry, my voice is a, a little is going out, but I, your reputation preceded you, um, and to say that I have been um, impressed and that it was a joy to work with you, um, you have brought heart, heart to the district. Your passion for kids, your passion for people in this community is evident, and I consider it a privilege to have worked with you and have learned so much from you. Thank you. Dr. Rowe, um, <clears throat> you're awesome. <laughs> no way to present it elsewise, otherwise. You're just absolutely awesome. You have stepped in, and of course, you are well known in the community. You are a pillar of the educational community as well as the Waco community in the broader sense. Um, you have been fully engaged in the community and 
I'm not going to say we're going to miss that because we hope you to stay engaged and stay with us at WISD for many, many years to come. Thank you, Dr. Rupp. Oh, Dr. Rowe, I just want to tell you personally, um, as a new board member who hasn't been on long, you are the most welcoming and um, enthusiastic person, and I've just loved getting to know you better. Um, my, my mom got to work with you for some time, and she told me how amazing you were, and she was not lying. You just have been a pleasure to work with. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Manning. <laughs> well, okay, Dr. Rowe, I love you. <laughs> Thank you for all of these warm, warm comments, as you can see. I've probably been around a long time because if her, I worked with her mom, that sort of tells you a little bit right there. But I want to thank the board. Uh, there was a very early morning call. I thought I was, they was dreaming when they would call my phone at seven o'clock in the morning when you're retired. I don't answer the phone that time of morning. That's what I do. But anyway, uh, this would not have been possible without an incredible, incredible team in the Waco community. The employees, the teachers, administrators, uh, everyone has stepped up and really moved with me and for me to get the success that we've had. So it, it hasn't been a job that I've had all by myself. But I wanna thank them for their support, the Waco community for its support. And uh, I, I think that as our motto for this year says, we're about to rise. And so I think that we are in poise to do that. And I'm anxious to see that happen for Waco ISD because I know that it can happen. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I may not be at every board meeting from now on, but, <laughs> but I will be engaged. <laughs> I, I wanted to say one. I didn't just want to repeat what everybody else said, but you, know, you reminded me of something. You're one of the funniest people I've ever met in education. <laughs> and I, well, I appreciate your humor. Thank you. All right, next item on our agenda is public comments. This is the portion of the board meeting where the board receives input from patrons. Each person who addresses the board will have three minutes to speak on his or her issue. Because of topic posting requirements of the Open Meeting Act, board members will not ask questions of the pa patron and will not answer any questions posed to the board by the patron. No action can be taken on any issue presented during the patron comment segment of the board meeting that is not already listed on the agenda. Patrons addressing the board will be notified by Mr. Dupuy. Is he paying attention? Uh, when, uh, yes, when they have approached the end of their allotted time to speak, which is three minutes. I have um, three um, forms completed. The first is from Mr. Gregory Alford. Mr. Alford, welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Having spent 12 years on a school board myself, I know the, the work that you go through and I thank you for doing that. My name is Greg Alvord and I'm running for the Texas State Board of Education, which represents McLennan County and 20 other counties from Waco to Denton. My background is in science and math. I'm a research computer scientist. I've been a, special, a uh, principal investigator for NASA on Apollo 14 through 17. I've worked at the Wadsworth Center for Health Research. 
I taught computer security at a Department of Energy and Department of, uh, of Energy and Defense facility. But my big passion is to bring the ideas of improved science and math education into the, into the schools. Back when I was in elementary school and in junior high, the last time the, ta the Russians attacked us technologically in Sputnik, the response of the country was to fund, the, def the Defense Department funded grants to improve science and math education. I lived in a small rural community close enough to a university that got one of those grants. They had all the people they needed to, uh, who wanted to learn how to teach math and science. What they didn't have was students to practice on. So every weekend and every summer I went and I got to have my own colony of rats researching epilepsy. I played with lasers. I learned to program in Fortran and BASIC. Since graduating from high school, I went on to get, a, get degrees in physics and math, and then uh, physics and astrophysics, and then computer science. Since I got out of graduate school in computer science, I've never once had a job title that existed when I graduated from high school. And the same is true of the students who are graduating Waco ISD this coming year. The future is something that we cannot predict. The future, but we can identify a few things that they need to understand in order to be prepared for this, this future that we, can't, that we can't predict. They need to be able to communicate written, orally, numerically. They need to be able to use the tools of our age as far as communicating those things. They need to learn to collaborate. I hate to tell the students in the room this, but all the problems that can be solved with a single brain have already been solved. And it's only through groups of people working together and sharing their talents that we'll face the future and solve the problems that we need to. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Greg Alvord, and I'm running for the Texas State Board of Education, District 14. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alford. Next, we have Anita Phillips. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. Hello, uh, Dr. Rowe, and to the board, it is good to see you. Uh, a couple of you already know me. Uh, before I get started, Dr. Rowe, uh, all the accolades you received, as you already know, are well-deserved. <laughs> I was very elated when I found out that you were going to be the interim superintendent, and I actually hate to see you go. So with that being said, I came to speak on one of the issues that's going to be before the board today, which is the new superintendent position that's being open. I have quite a few concerns. Um, don't get me wrong. I've looked over Dr. Kincannon's uh, experience. And while I, I have to admit I was very impressed with it, it still brings me about some concerns because of the districts that she's worked with versus our district. Um, our district is a very diverse district. Majority, the highest percentage of our students are at-risk students. A lot of our schools are failing schools. And it's hard for me to stand here and say this to you because I came from this district. I moved back to Texas from the state of Tennessee and was transferred back in the military because of the fact that I wanted my children in this district instead of a district that was $12.5 million short on their budget mm -hmm. and children that were graduating from high school that couldn't give back change if the register went down. 
So imagine my dismay when one of my own that thankfully graduated June um, slipped through the cracks a number of times in this district. I had to remove my child from this district and homeschool her before returning her to University High School for her to graduate because I was able to trust the staff at University High School. Even then, as y'all know, some of you know, there was an issue in the 2015-2016 school year with Dr. Strange. My daughter was a graduate of the 2016 class. And even when I heard the announcement at the graduation, I knew it didn't sound right. And I graduated from University High School and it didn't sound right. So now, when I start hearing about everything that's going on and I find out about the personal and business ties that the president of the board has with the candidate, that brings about concerns for me because it brings about an ethical issue for me and it brings about an integrity issue for me. Even with that, even if you were able to explain that away and push that aside, it's still a question about whether or not she would be able to be able to successfully turn our district around to where we need to be under, under the circumstances that she's never had to deal with a district of, of, the, of this magnitude before. Although I've gotten all of my children out of Waco IC, as a part of the community, I'm still responsible for the children in, the, in Waco ISD. And so I rarely come out unless it's something that I feel is not in the best interest of the children for Waco ISD. So this, this is something that I'm just, I'm not too happy with. I'm thinking that other considerations need to be made. Other things need to be explained. I mean, that's fine. But I appreciate the fact that y'all are actually taking that, taking the statement into account. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. And next I have Marlon Jones. To Dr. Rowe, uh, Madam President and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to share tonight. My name is Marlon Jones and I stand as a concerned parent. I have four children uh, who are currently uh, in schools in Waco ISD. I have three children at J.H. Hines and I have uh, one child at Tennyson. I stand uh, to raise a concern, a concern that I have formally expressed in a formal complaint to TEA uh, regarding a conflict of interest with our board president uh, and incoming superintendent. The concern is that uh, there is both business and personal relationships that create a conflict of interest and I believe cloud judgment in making decisions. Uh, as we come to item number 11 on the agenda, my hopes uh, is that that item is not simply there as a formality uh, but that we are truly considering um, what really goes into making the decision to choose someone as a leader. Uh, but when you have uh, business dealings in terms of representing a district as an attorney, uh, when you have personal business dealings, that is owning a home that is rented out as an Airbnb, uh, those uh, without a doubt cloud vision. Uh, I am uh, somewhat upset uh, because in this very room, at the close of last school year, I sat here with many community members uh, and was asked the question, what were we looking for in a superintendent? The things that we shared are not reflective of the superintendent that has been selected. When we look at educators in Belton ISD, we understand that there are 24 African American educators. Waco ISD has 150. Uh, when we look at the educators in Belton ISD, we know that there are only 86 Hispanic educators. Waco ISD has over 200. And when we begin to look at student demographics, the numbers are even more startling. 
I am extremely concerned, not simply because of where Waco ISD is, especially in the community in which I live and my youngest children attend school. My concern is not can a superintendent turn that around. My concern is that board members were present when it declined. And if they were present while it declined, uh, maybe it is not the superintendent that we need to examine. Uh, maybe we need report cards on the board. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I do not have any other um, requests to address the board. Okay. At this time, um, if it's okay with Ms. Davis, <laughs> I propose that uh, uh, we move item 11, consider, discuss, and take appropriate action regarding the approval of offer to employ new superintendent and or, and or superintendent's contract up uh, on the agenda to item 7. Is, does anybody have an objection to that? No, thank you. Um, before I um, ask whether or not um, anyone's ready to uh, make a motion, um, as Mr. Jones has pointed out tonight, um, for more than uh, 10 years, Susan Kincannon has been my colleague and become my friend. For 10 years of the 12 or more that I have known her, she was my boss. That relationship has given me an opportunity to get to know her, to get to know her work, and most importantly, to get to know her why. Dr. Ken Cannon became an educator because of the difference that public education made in her life. She didn't tell this story for a long time. I didn't know it for a long time after I first met her. Um, but she was removed from her home as a child. In third grade, she was placed into foster care. She was separated from her parents and her five sisters. She lived in poverty and experienced trauma that today she's not comfortable talking about, and I'm sure she's not real happy that I'm talking about it right now. But there's more that me than meets the eye. And over the last uh, week especially, assumptions have been made about who this woman is based on how she looks and where she comes from. And I think we've all experienced times in our lives when people have either underestimated us or people have attributed certain thoughts or biases to us that were not fair, that we didn't personally experience, and that were hurtful. <coughs> Dr. Ken Cannon began school as a fourth grader in an unfamiliar city, an unknown school, new teachers and peers, and was really lost until a, her fourth grade teacher took an interest in her, believed in her, and was there for her. And she ultimately, ins ultimately inspired her to find ways to be there for kids in situations like the one she had been in. Dr. Ken Cannon wrote in her application for the job as the Waco ISD superintendent, it was with this teacher's support I found out that I loved learning. I became a teacher to pay it forward. I wanted to make a difference to children by instilling in them a love of learning. She became a teacher probably in no small part to that fourth grade teacher she met that year. And she was dedicated to making sure that students knew that their teachers believed in them. 
she became a superintendent because she wanted to be there for even more students and she wanted to make a difference. She learned that high expectations and safe and positive cultures in every area of a school district's operations are critical to a success. And she said in her application for this job, the quest to produce something special and impact the lives of children is why I continue to be inspired and motivated to do this work. Now Dr. Ken Cannon wants to become Waco ISD superintendent. She believes in our kids because getting to the, know them has reminded her why <laughs> she became an educator. Since the article in the newspaper last week, I have heard critics of Dr. Ken Cannon say, we have to improve our schools. And it was just like Ms. Phillips said. It's, it's disappointing to all of us that our schools have failing ratings. We all want our schools to be better. I agree with Ms. Phillips wholeheartedly. Improving our schools and getting passing grades for all of our campuses and making sure that we offer our community the best education possible for our children has been at the forefront of my mind throughout the search for our next superintendent before I was aware that Dr. Ken Cannon was interested in the job. With every application and each interview, I asked myself, does this person have the skill set and the experience to improve our schools? Critics have also said that the next superintendent should not be learning on the job at our kids' expense. That this superintendent doesn't know our kids, doesn't understand our kids, and therefore she's going to be learning the job at our expense. Well, I disagree, but I do agree that experience and expertise are important. And being an administrator who helps implement someone else's plan is not the same thing as being the superintendent who's ultimately responsible for the plan itself. Experience working with a board's critical, since the plan must be developed with this board's support. Working as a team of eight to make change is hard. It's hard. I'm sure you've all seen that. We all come to this board with different perspectives. We all have different experiences and we all have different backgrounds, but we all share the love for the children in this city and we all want what's best for them. And being an effective superintendent requires humility, patience, tolerance, clarity of purpose and vision, and the superintendent has to be laser focused on the student. And I knew we needed someone who would not bring learning to the job of a superintendent. I knew that we needed someone with experience. Dr. Ken Cannon's body of work demonstrates that she has success implementing community plans. She listens. To those of you who doubt that and have already written her off and you're not going to be interested to see whether or not that's true, I know she listens, I've watched it, and she's listening tonight. She's listening tonight to what's important to our students, our families, and our community. It goes without saying that she has expertise in curriculum and instruction, and we all know that we can take all the help we can get there. Proven success as a superintendent is critical, and a deep understanding of curriculum and instruction is also critical, and Dr. Ken Cannon has both. She has both to a degree that was unmatched by any other applicant. Ultimately, though, I don't expect you to simply take my word for it. I didn't expect this board to take my word for it. 
Hiring Dr. Ken Cannon is not a decision that I made alone. It's a decision this board made collectively after going through the process, the same process we followed for Dr. Nelson, the same process we followed for Dr. Kane. Working with the TASB search consultants who we used for Dr. Nelson and for Dr. Kane, we gathered information from this community and yes, we did gather information from groups such as yours, Mr. Jones, that day. We reviewed 84 applications, we interviewed candidates, we interviewed candidates again, and then we sent board members to Belton to meet with their board, their staff, their parents, and community members, and to visit their schools. Because of Belton's proximity to Waco, all members of this board were invited to participate in the site visit. We're all individuals, and we all make our own decisions. And in this case, this is probably not going to be a unanimous decision, and that's all right. I think it's important, and each board member will have an opportunity to explain the reasons for their respective votes tonight, It takes courage to serve on a school board. It's a volunteer job. We don't have to be here, but here we are. And our constituents expect us to show up. They expect us to express our concerns during our meetings. They expect us to share our disagreement when we have them. And we expect, they expect us to vote. It takes courage to step forward and say that you want to lead our district, that you want to serve our families because you believe in our kids. I'm thankful for the courage of my fellow board members who are sitting up here with me tonight. And I'm thankful for Dr. Kincannon's courage. I know that each of us on this board and in this room and in this community we all want our schools to succeed. We all want the best for all of our kids. And for that reason, I voted for Dr. Ken Cannon to be our lone finalist. There's not, you can't put everything in the newspaper in an article. It would be impossible to encapsulate all of the discussions that this board had over the, this past summer. And so it's, it's not really not fair to expect that a newspaper could reflect everything in every conversation. But certainly, my relationship with Dr. Ken Cannon was discussed by this board repeatedly, often, and the issue of whether or not I should have recused myself three weeks ago was also discussed with my fellow board members. And when I offered to recuse myself for the perception, my fellow board members said, no, you do not need to do that. And I depend on my fellow board members to share with me the concerns they have from their constituencies and their communities. It's for that reason that I did not recuse myself. I do not have a conflict of interest that would, would merit a uh, recusal. But I do have to say that I depended on the colleagues that I have up here on the dais to help me make that decision after we discussed it as a group. With that, I will entertain a motion I, um, for the item up for consideration. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the contract as presented. Thank you, Mr. Vidania. Is there a second? A second the motion. Thank you, Ms. Houston. Is there any discussion? Mr. Dupuy was speaking. Yeah. Are you done? 
There has been a request for a roll call vote. When y'all are ready, let me know. I don't want to discourage anyone from speaking. Sykes. My comments will be brief. <clears throat> the untimely departure of Dr. Nelson started the process we are concluding tonight. I appreciate the discussions that have ensued since March. Selection of a superintendent is the most important role of the Board of Trustees. My decision to support Dr. Ken Cannon is based on her extensive work at the highest educational administrative levels for an extended period of time in addition to the site visit, visit which validated her broad knowledge and experience with strategic planning curriculum and instruction as well as the personal interviews during the due diligence process i learned the persons that know her best are universally supportive of Dr. King Cannon and never expressed doubt about her management and leadership abilities across a wide spectrum of challenges. We are most fortunate to have Dr. King Cannon ready to assume the position of Waco ISD superintendent. If I may, he didn't know I was gonna do this, but I'd like to insert a comment provided as stated by Mr. Badania in today's newspaper where he recognizes the diversity and differences between <coughs> Belton and Waco. But, and I will quote, we still have to give her an opportunity because you can't hold people back from doing a job just because they come from a different background. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sykes. Ms. Houston? Yeah, I just have a, another brief comment. Um, Dr. Ken Cannon came to us a very, very strong candidate. Nothing during the interview process made me think otherwise. Um, she answered all the hard questions that were posed to her. She has a strong background in curriculum and instruction, and I think given some of the challenges we face as a district, that's very, very critical. She's respected by Region 12. She's well known in Region 12, and she is well loved by the district that she's leaving, and they are very sad to see her go. Um, I agree with everything that Mr. Sykes just said, and I don't want to really repeat a lot of those things, but I have every confidence that she's going to be able to lead this district in the right direction. Ms. President. Mr. You see my comments in the uh, Waco trip uh, with uh, Brooke Crumb. If you have any questions about where I stand, go back to Saturday's paper and read Saturday's paper. I'm sorry. She is not the person for WISD. <coughs> Mr. Dupuy? I'm sorry, I was, or no, are you fine? Okay, okay. I'm just as confident, Susan, that you are the person for the job. And uh, you didn't need this job. You had one. I know, I'm not sure I understand all the reasoning behind it, but you feel a sense of purpose and drive and mission in coming up here. And my aim is to be useful in helping you be successful in any way I can. It's all about the kids. And that's what's more, most important to me is that we provide those educational opportunities. And I have come to be an admirer of your skill set and your successes in that, uh, uh, in that venture, and I'm here to help you. Thank you. 
and I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Ms. Cordaway. Uh, Dr. Kincannon, sorry, my voice is a little bit out, so um, uh, Ms. Houston was kind enough to give me a cough drop, but I, uh, you know, I don't doubt that you come with strengths. There are a lot of strengths that you have as an educator that you come with, that you're bringing, years of experience. So I'm not negating those, and I see them. You know, I think the one thing that I get hung up on is when I look at the campus in your district that was 88% low socioeconomic, high percentage of limited English proficient students, and that campus got a D rating. That campus mirrors a lot of the campuses here in Waco. And when I look at your body of work in terms of residing superintendent, I also want to acknowledge in Belton, it's a very different district, so you haven't had the opportunity to showcase your ability with a um, high percentage of low socioeconomic, the dynamics that we have in this, in this school district. And so, you know, I think um, when Ms. Phillips said, you know, that her, her daughter slipped through the cracks, I think well, we can't afford that in this district. We can't afford to let a school slip through the cracks. And, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I want and hope that you prove me wrong more than anything. I would love and it would be my greatest joy if you were to prove me wrong. Um, I think I echo Carrie's sentiments. I will do whatever it takes to support you um, in this um, endeavor, in this district, because bottom line, it's the students that matter first. And I, uh, yeah, I really sincerely mean it. It would be my greatest joy if you were to prove me wrong. Are we ready to vote? Yes. I have been asked to um, have a roll call vote. Ms. McCutcheon? Are you ready? Yes. Right. Trustee Houston? Um, yes. Trustee No. Uh, Vice President Sines? Yes. Madam President? Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 And Secretary Manning? My vote is for the majority minority students of Waco Independent School District, and the vote is no. All right, motion passes. Welcome, Dr. Kincannon. Um, welcome your family, your husband, and Kale. Do you mind um, standing up and introducing them to us? Sure, I'd be honored um, okay. to introduce yeah. them. Um, miss my husband, Keith Kincannon, and my daughter, Kale. Um, and I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to serve. Um, have had the uh, privilege of visiting with a number of staff members over the last three weeks and I've been very impressed um, with the talent and the commitment and dedication to the students of Waco ISD and I just look forward to serving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now a public hearing on budget and proposed tax rate for the 2019-2020 fiscal year, Ms. Davis. I have been told it's going to be brief. <laughs> that was not a look of confidence you just gave me, Ms. Davis. Okay. So we have um, prepared, we have to follow a number of laws in preparing our budget and tax rate. The first is the Education Code, Section 44002. We have prepared it in accordance with law. 
the superintendent is charged with preparing the budget or superintendent's designee. We did present a proposed budget on August 7th. We're required by lottery to um, prepare one by August 20th, and so we have met that criteria. Um, we do have a comparison of the proposed budget as compared to the prior year's budget. Um, it's posted on our district's financial transparency webpage, and you can find that by going through the um, district's web page, going to departments and financial transparency is one of the categories there. We are also required under Texas property tax law to follow certain steps in adopting our tax rate. We have followed those steps. We adopt a maintenance and operations rate and an interest and in sinking rate. The m and rate helps to pay all the operating expenses of the district and our INS rate um, pays for our principal and interest on our voter approved debt service. Um, both the, the property tax collections through both the MNO and INS tax rates are, are basically our local match in leveraging state revenue. This is our truth in taxation, and again, this is part of the notice that we have published in the newspaper, um, and we, I'm just going to go over this briefly. Our proposed tax rate is, our MNO rate is $1.6. 835 and the debt service rate is 0 0.2341 and those are per hundred dollars of valuation. In comparison with last year's budget, the maintenance and operations budget has increased 13.03 percent. A lot of that is because of the new state revenue that has been pushed into the system this year, and the debt service rate is 5.6% increase in that budget. Now that, we have the same tax rate in debt service, but that increase is in property tax revenue due to increases in our um, appraised values. So our total, ex total budget has increased 12.35%. Looking at our appraised values, the appraised values for last year were $9.2 billion, and they are almost $9.7 billion this year. That is just over a 6% increase in um, the appraised value of all property. Our new, the appraised value of new property is lower this year than it was last year. Last year we had 105 million in new property. This year, 77 million. And the taxable value of that new property, as you see, a um, little bit different here because most of the new property this year is taxable, where it was not as much last year. But last year we had 99.8 million in new uh, taxable value, and this year it's 70. 5.2. Our total bonded indebtedness that our debt rate will fund, this is our um, outstanding unpaid principal, is $148 million. So this is a comparison of those tax rates. Our m and tax rate last year, we have, we did pass a tax ratification election and raised our tax rate in 2015-16 and has remained the same since then, it was $1.17. And then the interest and sinking rate, as I said, was 23.41 cents for a total tax rate of $1.4041. Um, the rate to maintain the same level of operations revenue and pay for debt service for the m and fund was 93.227 cents and is interest in sinking again is the rate that we're a little over the rate we're adopting of 23.412 cents. Um, the proposed tax rate for our m and rate is $1.6835. Now, the state came in as part of House Bill 3 that funded school districts this year, and they compressed our maintenance and operations uh, rate by about 93 cents. Uh, the rate is built, uh, is composed of about three different pieces. We have um, 
some guaranteed yield pieces, our golden pennies and our copper pennies, and they were all compressed a little bit differently. But uh, this is the maximum tax rate that we can adopt for this year, and that's that $6,835 as compressed by the state. The interest in sinking, as I said, is the same rate that we've had this past year. That gives us a total tax rate of $1.3245. And you can see the amount, the level of revenue per student is very similar between the years. Last year was um, 5,891 per student uh, in local revenue. In state revenue, you see that increase. Last year it was 4,534 per student. This year it is 5,680. Uh, this is what the impact on our average residents the average market value of residents went from 133,000 to 141,000 this year. The average taxable value went from 95,000 to 107,000. The last year's rate, um, as I said, was $1.4041, and this year's rate is $1.30, so that's just over a 10 cent decrease in our overall tax rate. So the taxes due on the even though the tax rate went down 10 cents, um, the tax bill's going up just a little bit because of the increase in values. So the taxes due on the average residents last year was 1,342.77. For this coming year, it'll be 1,395.41, and that's a 52.64 cent um, increase. The voter approval rate, new language for what we used to call the rollback rates, now the voter approval rate, and that is that $1.30 to um, 2465 that we are adopting. This is just a quick look at our official budget. The official budget for the district is made up of the general fund, child nutrition fund, and the debt service fund. As I said, those are included in that comparison chart that you can find on our website. Our estimated revenue for the general fund um, is $164.5 million. Our appropriations are just short of that. The difference you see there in the 184,000, you see going out as an operating transfer. Right now, we're anticipating that that's what we will need to fund our Guama and Guaca programs, much lower transfer than we've had in past years. Our beginning fund balance in the general fund is 42.3 million, and so we're, at this point, we have a balanced budget so ending fund balance of 42.3 million. Child nutrition fund, 11.2 million, both revenues and expenditures. Um, still have a sizable fund balance there that we're actually trying to draw down with some capital um, expenditures. Debt service fund, we have a $15.6 million fund balance. Appropriations are just short of that right now, so we have a about 71,000 increase in the fund balance. Um, that is mostly due to anticipated um, investment earnings. So if you can see here, this is the, these three budgets together. The general fund makes up 86% of the total budget, most of the budgets in our general operating fund. The debt service fund is 8% of that, and our child nutrition fund is 6%. Looking at it by revenue source, uh, this is a little bit different than we've been seeing because with the state putting more money in this year, that's sort of even those out. Um, this past year, our local revenue was much higher percentage-wise than our state revenue. So this year, our local revenue is 47%, state program revenue 46% and our federal program revenue of 7%, mostly going into the Child Nutrition Fund. Looking at our appropriations by functional category, the greatest percentage is in, of course, instruction and instructional related services, that's 47%. The uh, second largest amount is in our non-student support services, that is, um, we did budget some um, contingency or some project money for our capital improvements program under our plant maintenance and operations budget. So that's a little higher than it has been, but this consists of, plant of maintenance, 
technology and security. We also have some um, rather large budgets set aside for technology and security this year. The second highest amount is 14% in our student services budget. The other categories that you can see are debt service, general administration runs about 3%, and our instructional and school leadership is about 7% of the budget. In this year's budget, we did include a salary increase. There were some requirements in House Bill 6 for salary increases. The average salary increase for um, employees that are paid on the teacher schedule was 7.6% and the counselors were included with the teacher group as part of um, that requirement, and so we did a 6% increase for counselors. Auxiliary and paraprofessional staff received 4%, and administrative and other professional staff received a 3% of the midpoint increase. We raised our starting teacher salary from 46,100 to 49,000, and the starting wage rate for our regular full-time auxiliary staff from $10.03 to $11 per hour. We include, we did um, add a number of new positions, primarily teachers uh, and aides, for classroom aides, 13 special ed teachers and 14 special ed aides, five dyslexia specialists, one campus administrator to assist in our special ed, um, ed referrals. We added an additional counselor and a student management specialist that is um, restoring a position that has been cut a couple of years ago, and then a couple of staff in maintenance and a couple in technology to help with all our new technology. Um, again, as I talked about, we have uh, quite a bit of dollars that have been set aside for some maintenance, uh, safety, and technology projects. This is looking just briefly at that debt service because we did. Um, did set our tax rate at the same as it was last year. You see in the next couple of years, our debt service is going to go down and then level off for a while. Um, and goes down in 20, fiscal year 2023. In preparation, trying to get this um, paid down, it goes out to 2038 right now. We are um, using part of that tax rate by not decreasing the debt service rate. We're going to sp spend about 780,000 to pay off about 650,000 early um, payoff of about 650,000 of debt. This is from the uh, bond series 2016. And uh, this is um, maturities uh, that from year 2038, so it's a long ways out there. Um, included at the bottom is some of what the district has done over the last few years. And we have been very good, I think, in um, re taking advantage of lower interest rates at times to refund some of our bonded debt. And as you can see, we have saved in doing those, including this um, early defeasance that we're talking about here, we have saved about $26 million in interest expense with what we've done with the refundings. So that's it for the budget presentation, short and sweet, I hope, and ready for public input. Ms. Davis, just a real quick question on the last slide there just to confirm is that series 2016 the savings of 477,000 is that net of fees is that net, net of, of fees, fees? Uh, no okay. it is not okay thank you how much of the <laughs> I'm getting better <laughs> in the hang of this gig uh, how much did the 12.35% increase in expenditures is salaries, teacher salaries? Well, we did put quite, we did, this teacher salary increase <coughs> cost us about a little over 6 million. We put about 
four million in CIP. Um, and as we were looking, there's a couple of million in salaries. So I would say that it's not quite half. Um, I would say it's about 40% of our increase was in, it was in salaries. Okay. Thanks. We were supposed to put 30%. Did you say teacher salaries only? I it's, okay. Salary I increases was a, a little under 40%, I think. Okay. Thanks, Cheryl. Yep. Any questions from the public? It was a public hearing, right? Yes? Okay, thank you. <coughs> item nine, consent agenda. I was not asked to remove any items from the consent agenda. Can I hear a motion to approve as presented? Um, Thank you, Mr. Dupuy. Thank you, Mr. Manning. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda as presented, say aye. 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 Thank you. Item 10, consider, discuss, and take appropriate action regarding adoption of the budgets for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. You don't have another presentation for that, do you? <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> Um, okay, well, um, if, unless, the, unless the board has any questions, uh, I'll entertain a motion um, to adopt the budget for the 2019-2020 fiscal year as presented. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Sykes. Thank you, Ms. Houston. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes unanimously. And item 11, consider, discuss, and take appropriate action regarding a resolution adopting the tax rate for the 2019 tax year. I'll entertain a motion on this item as well. Madam President. Yes, sir. I move that we adopt a tax rate of $1.30245 for the 2019 tax year. And in doing so, note, this year's proposed tax rate does not exceed the effective tax rate. A motion to adopt an ordinance, resolution, or order setting the tax rate does not require the language about tax increase as stated in code section 26.05B of the property tax code. Thank you. Mr. Sykes, is there a second? <laughs> My pleasure, Mr. Dupuy. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Dupuy. Any discussion? Did I second? Yes, I know. Yeah. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 You opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Uh, with that, we Ms. are. Mr. President. Yes, sir. Um, I got a question. Yes, sir. Who did the? Uh, I know we just did the uh, consent agenda. But who is responsible for this a student code of conduct? Um, I had asked Dr. Rowe that question, and Israel Correa and his team. Who? Ms. No, 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 no. I just have a private question about why we can't have time deflect. I mean, time. Time deflate was on campus. Do you have one in your trunk? <laughs> I, Are deflators I, on campus? I get with you. This, this is more of a personal thing, not, 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 not for open discussion. <laughs> no, Dr. Ken Cannon can, can look into that when she begins work next, next week. Mr. DeVere. They are, not, they are not allowed on campus. I think, I think the only person should have one is uh, Chief Williams. Uh, Mr. DeBeer, are you prepared um, with announcements? We have one of the highlights of the fall tomorrow night with the Hall of Fame kickoff classic that features University High and Waco High facing off with kickoff at 7.30 at the Waco ISD Stadium. We'll also be inducting the new class of members of the Waco ISD Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh, then on September 13th, the Waco High School Choir has the honor of performing for the State Board of Education in Austin. 
And on September 21st, our friends at Providence are hosting the Ascension Medical Mission at home at the Convention Center starting at 8 a.m. This is a great resource for the community that allows uh, kids to have free access to medical and vision care, adults to have free access to medical, dental, and vision care. There are a lot of screenings available, immunizations, other forms of support, opportunities to tie into insurance. All of our families will be receiving information um, home with their students next week, and we just want to make sure that the community is aware of this great resource that's available. Thank you. Any other announcements? No? With that, then, we are adjourned. Good night. <laughs>